Years ago, when I was an energetic beekeeper, I actually built my own equipment. In fact, that's one of the reasons I got started in beekeeping. Kim's not here today. I've asked Jeff to sit by. Jeff, you okay talking about this? Sure, Jim. Thanks for inviting me to Honey Bee Obscura, and I'd be happy to talk about woodworking and beekeeping equipment. I used to do some of that. Didn't we all? I'm glad you're here. Thanks for sitting in. Hi, I'm Jim Too. And I'm Jeff Ott from Beekeeping Today Podcast. And we're coming to you on Honey Bee Obscura, where once a week we talk about something to do with beekeeping. And today, one of us, either I or Jeff, decided to talk about how we have in our lives combined two hobbies, woodworking and beekeeping. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Doesn't take it long to get it out of your system in most cases, does it, Joe? <laughs> no, about the first weekend. <laughs> yeah. I have been a woodworker all my life. I'm not accomplished. I would say that I'm a click to a click and a half above average. I've got a, a reasonably nicely set up woodworking shop that I don't use often enough. So mm-hmm. as a young man, when I stumbled into beekeeping, literally, Almost taking a beekeeping class by accident when I saw all that wooden stuff. I had the thought that has lived with me forever. I can build all of this. Yeah, right. What beekeeper with any woodworking tools at home hasn't thought that? Well, I was going to say that's a very common thought for mo- uh, for many beekeepers is, is say, well, that's a simple box. I can do that and I can save lots of money I'm, or, or, you know, I can, I can do that. I mean, that's that's just basically it. I can do that. Well, I was naive at first. I was going to do it because I, I could do it, and the equipment would be almost free, just the cost of the lumber, never mind the cost of all the tools, the time. All, that didn't matter if it's going to be almost free. But I, I got and I get a significant f- feeling of satisfaction. Mm-hmm. You know, this is really my bee operation. I built the boxes. I raised the queens. I mean, I'm with this thing from the ground up. So it gives me a great sense of satisfaction. In fact, Jeff, everything I've ever built, any furniture, anything, I could have bought cheaper. (laughs) So it didn't take me long to realize that that you're never going to be able to build this stuff cheaper than the big supply companies. Yeah. Well, they have the, the, the power of buying in bulk. I mean, look at price of lumber these days. Yeah. It's just through the roof. So I guess, we. I mean, we're starting out at the very beginning of this episode, just talking, you're not going to save money building your own bee equipment. But that's not the reason why you do it. No, it, it, it was at first. It was briefly, ever so briefly. I, what really broke me, Jeff, was on Christmas morning, just as quickly as I could get through the ceremony of gift giving and, you know, pondering the significance of the event, just the time I could get away, I dashed out the dad's shop and began to knock out blanks that I was going to use to build my own end bars with. So for about a year, I built my own frames. Mm. I, one time I counted, it must have had 17, 15, 14, 15 different cuts and different <laughs> setups to build and each of those frames. And I, I realized with the stack of those things there, like an epiphany, what are you doing? It's Christmas <laughs> Day, and you're out here cutting out blanks to build end bars that will cost you three times more than what the end bars I could buy would cost. And I began to get my feet back on the ground and to realize that you need to woodwork uh, just just as much as you need to, Mm -hmm. but I'm probably not going to build my own equipment. Boy, when I say that, I'm firing off somebody out there who's got a shop set up, dedicated stationary saws, 
jigs that work everything, and they knock out this stuff by the thousands. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about Billy Joe, beekeeper with the table saw. Yeah. That's the guy I'm looking at. Well, I think it's it's a it's a worthwhile effort. I think if, if you're a beekeeper and you have a skill set with woodworking and you have the tools— why not? I think you should do yourself a favor and 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 build a box, build a top, build a bottom board. Absolutely. Uh, it's like building it. a birdhouse. Yeah. I mean, you can buy birdhouses all day cheaper than you can just knock a birdhouse together. But you build your own birdhouse and the birds move in and you just feel so nurturing yeah. about the whole thing. I use number two pine lumber, but, you know, I've also used scrap. I came across at Ohio State, I came across a large pile of scrap plywood that was given to the B program. And I mm -hmm. worked mightily to get a square edge on one side and then cut blanks out of that and, and made, I must have made 80 or 90 tops, migratory tops out of it. Mm -hmm. So I guess the second thing, Jeff, is where do you get your lumber? If you're having to go over to a big box store and buy three boards at the time, that's really going to set you back. Yeah. If you're going to go buy a pickup truck load, then you're getting in deeper and deeper, aren't you? So where you get your lumber, how you come about, it's the whole thing. I know many, uh, some of the beekeepers I know who build their own equipment, and, and they don't build it all the time. Uh, the guys I know uh, would is scrap lumber. So they'll pick up uh, odds and ends. And like you said, with this, uh, Ohio State, you you cut a square edge and then then build everything from that. And it might be you have multiple different types and or origin sources of of your lumber, and and they just enjoy that the scrappiness of building yes. their own equipment. Yeah, you know, thing I wasn't going there. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Not only was I building my own equipment. For mm -hmm. a project that I love, beekeeping, I was also repurposing this old plywood lumber that came from the dairy farm. So it had an right. ambience about it. Right. When you heated that wood up and cut it, boy, you were back in the dairy business all of a sudden. <laughs> but then those those uh, migratory covers, those are just flatboard covers. I mean, they mm -hmm. could not be any simpler. They're just a flatboard cover with a cleat on both ends. Commercial beekeepers use migratory covers a lot. Since we're talking about lumber source and lumber, is there any lumber that a beekeeper wanting to make their equipment should steer, steer away from? Should steer away from, or if you use it, you should know the characteristics of it. Now, I'm caught off yeah. guard. Great question that I haven't had much response time to. If you use <laughs> aromatic red cedar, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the... It's been said that the bees are not crazy about that. No, no more than than clothes moths are crazy about aromatic red cedar. But here in Ohio, Amishmen sometimes use red cedar with the you know the strong cedar odor mm -hmm. to build an inner cover, and they have some notion that in some way that helps do something with wax moths. I'm not sure what, hmm. but the first the first species of lumber that comes to mind is aromatic. Aromatic red cedar due to the insect uh, repelling characteristics of it. Others have said that black walnut. Why would why in the world would you use black walnut well, to build a bee box? I don't know, but black walnut with its juglans uh, compound in it suppresses growth beneath the tree. Uh, that can be iffy stuff. And, you know, p people don't use, I understand people don't use uh, black walnut for horse bedding. Can you address that? No, uh, Jim, no, we never use black walnut for horse bedding. It's, it's a known problem for horses in a condition called laminitis. So it was never offered to us. We wouldn't have taken it if it was given to us. And quite honestly, I don't know whether it's a problem for beekeepers and bees. Maybe one of our listeners knows. You know, I got a I got an Amish beekeeping friend who who preferentially builds all, and he builds it for sale. I I mean, every year to go down to the surround the neighboring county and buy some, he makes it out of sassafras, which wow. I don't know why. But anytime I work sassafras, and I've worked it a lot, it always smells like shrimp boil to me. <laughs> I always think about boiled or steamed shrimp when I'm working sassafras. And the stuff undergoes a radical color change. And I was yeah. at an Amish bee meeting last July. 
and he was there with his Sassafras B equipment, and I asked him, what's up with that? And he said, I just really like Sassafras. I mean, funny? he has to glue the boards up to get them wide yeah. enough, so it's I, I need to buy some before this guy stops doing it. Oh, that would be interesting. I, I, we used to, you know, pull twigs of sassafras and chew on them, and and, and yeah. I enjoyed the I enjoy this taste, but I never considered making any bee equipment out of it. Boy, I can tell you for a fact, there's people who are eager to sell you that. If you don't want it, we've got one of those companies right here who sponsor us. Hi, we're starting the winter holiday celebrations. Nothing is better for a stocking stuffer, hostess gift, or party favor than honey, homemade hand cream, candles, or lip balm. If you want to learn how to craft these or other products of the hive, such as beeswax, you can visit betterbee.com for tips, tricks, and products made by love by you and your honeybees. So from all of us at Better Bee, we wish you wonderful winter holidays and terrific celebrations. You know, for those of you who are just listening to us and thinking, well, I should probably, like a bird box, I should probably build a bee box. Don't even worry about the joints. Just use a simple butt joint. Just nail them together and then just know that you're never going to move that, that bee box to Florida. It would not stand the stress and the weight. But if you want to build the simplest box you can, just use butt joints. Just put two boards together and nail them up. Well, I would glue them. I would recommend you get some old, good, all-purpose, all-weather glue and yeah. make sure you glue that joint Certainly as well. wouldn't hurt. Use spiral shake nails. You know, right away, we're taking mm -hmm. a simple box and making it complicated. But most <laughs> of us, what I, what I did most of was rabbit joints, just those simple rabbit joints that I cut on a table saw. I would mm -hmm. almost say, Jeff, that a table saw is a necessity. You can get by yeah. with a router if you're building a few, but if you're really going to knock out some bee boxes, table you're going saw. to need a table saw. Uh, you you were talking about the, the joints and the simple box joint. I remember one the one summer I built equipment, <laughs> and I had my fancy dancy big craftsman router and i got a a, a dove oh, a dove, I knew a dove you joint were going to, <laughs> router jig i knew you were going to say that <laughs> and yeah yeah I, I sometimes i wonder if someone's still sitting around with that box in their backyard and i'm sure it's not there now but sitting there who's the fool who spent the time making dove <laughs> joint? making true dovetails <laughs> yeah that's funny a lot of beekeepers call those box joints Finger joints. Yes. Yeah. From a woodworking standpoint, they're not the same thing. A box joint is what is commonly used to manufacture bee boxes. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of it, Jeff, but there was a company that probably in the early 80s just went away like these providers so often do, but they made a dedicated small table saw for cutting box joints. It was, you had to provide your own motor. They sent mm -hmm. you the simple table saw. There was no height adjustment. Everything was preset. And you put their jig on there and you began to knock out box joints immediately. And interestingly, we'll talk more about this in a bit, maybe, maybe not. They put in a wing cutter. A what? Yeah. A wing cutter, W-I-N-G. It was a dangerous looking thing. Big piece of equipment that you put on the side of the dado head, and it would cut out the handhold. Mm. But you needed a three quarter to a one horse motor because it would really pull that motor down. A little bit of smoke, some chip out, but it gave you something that was a pretty good rendition of a handhold. I'm into this now because that company that saw that equipment is all gone. I I don't know. If you can even find the stuff used. That's an interesting consideration because you don't really need to cut in handholds. I mean, you can take some one by and build just grips on the side of the box. And many beekeepers do that. And and they work effectively. So yeah. someone doesn't have to take the time to write us and say, well, then you can't stack that equipment side by mm -hmm. side. 
You're going to have, what, an inch and a half space between every stack of equipment because the handholds butt up. But they are so easy to do. I want that same bottle of glue that you had a bit ago. Mm-hmm. And take that one and a quarter to one and a half inch strip, three quarter inches thick, the 16 and a quarter inches wide, and put in three screws, glue that on, and it makes an improved handhold mm -hmm. that I know could beekeepers whose name I shouldn't call would put those strips on over the manufactured handholds because they liked them so much better. Well, and, and if you use telescoping tops, then having that strip on the side is not going to make any difference anyways. You're not going to be stacking them side by side, right. bunched right. up against each other. Now you're getting defensive. No, I'm not defensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not defensive. Now you're uh, pointing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, about, a, about a fourth of my boxes have the cleats on there. Mm -hmm. they, they just, I got them somewhere else. I put them on for dis demonstrative purposes, but the cleats are there. Most of us just use our dado head and slice into the face of the board and cut a slot there, which is always a, a sign that it's homemade equipment because mm -hmm. that's always a characteristic of homemade equipment. It's too hard to make an authentic looking handhold. One of the things that always comes to my mind these days is insulation. And when we're talking about handholds, one I do recall the one of the considerations about handholds is you're taking away material on the side of that hive, yeah. and that's going to create a, a, a colder spot. Now, whether that really, in in the big picture of things, really makes a difference inside the hive and the thermal dynamics, et cetera, so forth, uh, I don't know, and I don't know if there's any studies. But th then I start thinking. So, besides the handholds issue, what about the the dimensions of the lumber. If you're building your own equipment, you're not stuck to the lumber that you can find at your local big box store. You can get thicker lumber, maybe right. two by, and more insulation value. Of course, you're having to carry it more. What, what do you think? I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Making non-standard, standard size equipment out of non-standard lumber. My first thought, it's an odd one. It's, it's one of fright. If I start changing the thickness of the lumber, then I'm going to change other dimensions too. And I'm going to need to be very careful that everything else still fits, especially the inside dimensions. If you know, if you and I said one thing today that's critical, if you're going to do build from anything, any mm -hmm. thickness lumber, you've got to have those inside dimensions spot on so yes. those frames fit. And, they gotta, and the box has got to be square. Inside dimensions have got to be spot on, and the, the box has got to be square. Everything else is up for grabs. So what's my opinion? Yeah, I, if I had one-inch stock, I'd probably build it. It'd take too much time to plane it down. But as far as the insulation parameters, I'd probably just insulate it with some yeah. of the modern-day bags, sacks, wraps, whatever. Mm, fair enough. But I, I support the insulation thing. Kim and I have talked about that in other episodes, and that's an interestingly complex subject. So mm -hmm. maybe more on that later, I guess. You, you mentioned dimensions uh, and, and maintaining the interior spacing. You should maintain B space. If not, then you're going to have to deal with the different you know, deal with the consequences. And it makes me think of when I did the article for Kim eons ago on woodenware for bee culture. And I noted all the differences where different manufacturers maintained their bee space between supers. Was that space on top of the frame or between a uh, bottom of the frame? Or was it split the difference between the top and uh, top of the frame and the bottom of the frame above it? Because if you didn't maintain that bee space between supers, then you had a preponderance of Burr comb or the frame stuck together, both of which made a beekeeper's life much more difficult. That That is a superb point. It's kind of a dirty secret that we say we have standardized beekeeping equipment. We have equipment that's 96% standardized, and that last 4%, I'm making those percentages up, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But that last 4% can just drive you crazy because oh, you're exactly yeah. right. Is there, is there a quarter inch on the bottom? 
and and the rest of the B space up top, or is all the B space up top and it flush on the bottom? I, I guess, having not thought about it and saying this spontaneously, I would probably, if you're going to build your own box, pick out a box that you really like, that you've been mm-hmm. using already, and your equipment has worked, and build, use that as a pattern. Yeah. If you go to the the web and pull one off, how deep is a rabbit going to be? Some rabbits are f- for frame rest are going to be five eighths. If you have a, f- a frame lifter, you'd want to cut that rabbit at seven eighths. So there's all these little variations, just enough in the details to drive you crazy. And the one you bring up is certainly a good one because they will glue that thing to, that super down solid. <laughs> after a good nectar flow, and you're going to have to have a wrecking bar to get that super separated with all that comb attaching it. And and we can say, well, I know I can say this from experience. Uh, you really want to pay attention to that B space between <laughs> supers. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, it's a self-correcting mistake. I'll just say that. <laughs> I want to be crystal clear. We're winding down, but I, I always built B equipment just because I enjoyed it. Yes. I was satisfied. I was fulfilled. I realized quickly I'm probably never going to save any money, but I was at home. I was happy. I slept well at night. I smelled like pine shavings mm-hmm. most of the day. It, it, it was a good, good, a good way to go. I, I had a good time doing it. So for those of you who still enjoy it, nothing wrong with it. Have at it. For those of you who want to buy your boxes and never build one, boy, that's another way to go. That's fine, too. Yeah. And there's a lot of resources for people who uh, have the desire to learn and, and build their own. There's Facebook groups, there's books, there's websites. Yeah. Uh, so there, y- y- you won't be making things up on your own. There's nope. a lot of resources for you. You will not. It's, it's, uh, it's like you're a specialized beekeeper, you know, not just queen production and not just pollen collection, but you're a, a woodworking beekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps you out of trouble in the wintertime. Yeah, I've always enjoyed it. I'm going to keep my tools as long as I am, but I probably won't build bee boxes anymore. Well, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on the show today and talk about building your own bee equipment. I don't think I'm going to run out and buy any more equipment today, but okay. it's it was an enjoyable experience when I did it, and I, I'm happy I did it. I enjoy talking to another woodworker for a change instead of another beekeeper. (laughs) All right, I wish you all the best. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks. All right. Till next time. Bye-bye.